Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's a good, that's a good, good morning. That's good. Maybe it's the coffee and the donuts that do that. Actually, that, it's that worship. It's a time of uh, lifting the name of the Lord together. Well, I have the freedom this morning to talk about whatever I want. So I'm not assigned a topic. And I knew that my audience would be youth, just a little bit younger than me. And so I decided that what I'm going to share this morning, I'm just going to share my testimony, my journey from when I was your age, actually I'll start a little younger, to where I am now. And I pray that God will use this to encourage you on your journey, okay? So my testimony in many senses has no wow factors, okay? Uh, I was, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, uh, went to church with my parents. I never rebelled against mom and dad. You know, I, I was a typical, uh, I was normal, okay? And, and you know what that means as far as had my own struggles, whatever. But I, I, I never rebelled against mom and dad and leaving home and getting to sin out into the world. Uh, I was respected within the church as a young man. And so I don't have anything like, wow, look what God saved me from according to what we often think about testimonies, okay? But don't get me wrong. Just because I grew up in a Christian home and never went out in the world out there, my heart was dreadfully selfish. And that's the base. That, that's, that's where our sin comes out of. The opposite of love is selfishness, okay? And so my heart was selfish. Uh, and probably my, one of my greater struggles as a young boy was pride, okay? Now, as a, as a young person, our family did some singing. We did some singing in some churches, some prisons, and then when I got a little older, I joined a local singing group, and we'd, we'd sing Saturday nights up at a prison. It was a great ministry. I loved doing it, and so I had this dream that uh, after I graduated from high school and I went to SMBI for a couple terms, I was going to do that, then I'm going to join the Gospel Echoes prison ministry, Okay, so they travel, you know, full time. You travel and you go into prisons and sing. Um, and I, that'd be great. That's what I want to do. So uh, I submitted my application to, to do that. And um, that's what I'm going to do. Now, I want to take you to May 1992. So I was 18 years old, a senior in high school. And our high school was in Denton, Texas at the ACE International Student Convention. And I had, a, I had a desire to serve God. I wanted to do what he wanted me to do. You know, I didn't know what all that looked like. You know, as an 18-year-old, as an uh, you, you don't have your life planned out. You know, what's ahead of you? I know, okay, I'm going to graduate. Uh, I'll go to Bible school, and I'm going to go to Gospel Echoes, and I want to get married. And kind of in that order, and don't want to miss out on any one of those, right? Uh, and then after, after you've done those things and you got married, you live happily ever after. So I knew that. So that was kind of what I was thinking. Well, I was at Denton, Texas, and in May of 92, on a Wednesday evening, when Daniel Howard preached a message, it was a mission message, and the point of his message was that we should be willing to, to go wherever God wants us to go. And as a, as a young person, God just spoke to my heart, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. I'm just... I want, to, I want to go wherever God wants me to go. So when Daniel Howard gave the invitation, uh, I knew it was for me. And it wasn't an invitation of confessing sin, of getting right with God. It was an invitation to make a commitment to saying, yes, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Went forward that night. I don't remember if I cried or not. But in my heart, I knew that's what I want. God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. That is one of the most influential decisions I've made in my life was that night as an 18-year-old. God took me serious. 
And the good news about that, you know, so I had my plans. So I'm graduating from high school, go to Bible school, do gospel echoes, get married, live happily ever after, okay? Uh, when I said, yes, God, I'll go wherever you want to go, it's not like I just say, okay, now, now what do I do? I continue on these plans, and yet God sees the big picture, and he said, okay, Rick was serious. He wants to go wherever I have him to go. So he orchestrated things that I could never orchestrate. Sometimes as a young person, you want to get a hold of this now while you're young because when you get old like us, you can really be in trouble when you think that you can control your life, okay? What keeps people from saying, yes, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go is you're giving up control, right? If you say, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go, then that means he's in charge, and you can't tell him, this is where I'm going to serve you, and this is how I'm going to serve you, okay? So let's just say that we decide that we don't want to give up control. You want to be in charge. How much control really can you have over your life? Huh? How much happens to us that is completely out of our control? And how foolish is it to say, I want to keep in control of my life, I who don't know the future, I who don't know where my end is, and I don't know what's ahead, I want to stay in control rather than trust the one who made me, who gave me the gifts and the talents and the weaknesses that I have. He created me exactly the way I am. He who knows my end from my beginning, he who knows my future so he who could organize my steps to get me to where he wants me to go, why would I say, no, I don't want you to be in charge. I'm going to stay in control. That makes no sense to me. Amen. And yet this is one of the biggest struggles that, that Christians have is saying, yes, God, will do whatever you want me to do. And we think that God is up there. He's just going to make life miserable for you. Let me tell you, young people, there's nothing I would rather do than do what God wants me to do and be where he wants me to be. God took me serious. Uh, I went back home, and I continued with life as planned, and, and that's what you need to do. You've got to continue with the plans you have, all the while saying, yes, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Being faithful, okay, being faithful. Uh, graduated, worked for my dad through the summer and, the, and the, the fall until I went to SMBI for two terms, and uh, then I'm going to go to Gospel Echoes. And I got a call from Gospel Echoes, you know, I'm accepted, so this, this is great. And, but they said, well, it, um, the opening isn't till, till November. Oh, and I was hoping to go in like May or June or at least July because we're going to go for a year and then I'll get married. So, okay, it's not opening until, until November. And the team that you wanted, I wanted to be with didn't have any openings. So I'd be with a different team. And I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure I want to go with this, okay? In the meantime, I'm talking to my, my girlfriend who's now my wife, Renita, was Renita Hostel, and she's in northern Minnesota at a mission church that our churches in Iowa had started back in the 1940s. Um, so she's up there, a small mission church, and she said, oh, my dad just came home from a school board meeting. And uh, so they had, there was a small mission church up there, and they had a, a small Christian school, and she said, they're going to shut down the school if they don't find a teacher. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I should go up there and teach school. So I knew I wanted to get married, and so we'll probably live up there anyways. Uh, Maybe I should come there and teach school. Now, what type of a calling is that? Like for me just to say, maybe I should come there and teach school. You know, usually the school boards have to go find the teachers, right? Uh, and by the way, I'm 19 at the time, okay? I don't remember how it all worked, but somehow uh, maybe Renita told her dad who told the, told the rest of the school board, and they contacted me, and they're delighted. They found somebody so they can save the school for one more year, Okay. So in August of 93, I moved to Minnesota. I'm 19 years old, and I'm to be the school teacher. 12 students in the school. I'm the only teacher. The school was not in a good place. Like, the leader who had been running it, had been wanting to retire, stepped down. They couldn't find anybody to replace him. And then finally, they found somebody to take his place for one year, and that didn't go so well. So uh, I didn't come into a situation where it was really great. And I'm a first-year teacher. I'm 19. Um, I entered what for many years was the hardest year of my life. Now, I didn't know this at the time. Um, but when 
I went to Minnesota, I felt God leading me there. And I knew, okay, I'm kind of giving up the gospel like it was a dream, okay? Uh, my motives and desires to do gospel echoes, to do in prison ministry, we're right, we're good. But as I look back in my life later on, I saw why God closed that door and opened the door for me to teach school, okay? I didn't know that I would be in communication the rest of my life. So starting to teach school was a good step in that direction. But God knew that as a 19-year-old, for me to join a ministry that puts me on a stage, singing, giving testimony every night, he knew that the pride in my heart, I couldn't handle it. So God closed that door. Instead, he sent me way up north to the basement of a church with 12 students who didn't want to be there, and he said, be faithful there. That was a difficult year. Uh, but God, God worked that year. We got married the following summer, and then my wife and I taught together, and uh, school grew to 18, and we ended up, I ended up teaching there for eight years before the Lord called us to Grenada as a, as a missionary pastor. Now, God knows what you can handle. Some of your dreams aren't gonna come true, okay? I don't believe that when I serve, when I say I'm going to follow God, all my dreams are going to come true. They aren't, okay? I still think it'd be really great to travel and sing, preaching in prisons and stuff. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I'd have loved that. But God had something else for me. And because of my, uh, because of, of pride, a struggle with pride, God said, Rick, I'm not going to allow that to happen. In teaching school, so that was, that was good. Those were good years. Put my heart into it, and, and, and things went well there. Uh, and then we had the call to go to Grenada. Like God just, God just put a burden in our heart. And this wasn't like a lot of, a lot of times um, you think you have to have a mission board contact you or this type of thing. Well, we had been to Grenada on water, uh, and then we were asked to go down then. We said no, and then went back with SMBI. We took a, six weeks off of teaching school and went back with a choir tour that was going to Grenada then. So, okay, yeah, we went again, and again we were asked to come back. And, and every time, the peace of God just, just didn't confirm it, okay? The peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you say yes to God, you're going to have a peace in your heart. When you say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, he will give you a peace, and you stay in that peace, okay? So we were asked to go to the mission field. Didn't, peace didn't take us there. So we continued to teach school. Well, after when we were in our seventh year of teaching school, all of a sudden I started having this desire, this burden to go to Grenada. I'm like, where's this from? You know, this is the middle of winter, and of course we get a desire to go to a tropical island in the middle of winter, right? Uh, but it didn't go away. So I told my wife, and you know what's interesting? My wife's dream or vision was to go to foreign missions when she was nine years old uh, Sylvia the lady from Romania spoke at her church and God spoke to her heart and she had a desire to go into foreign missions we meet get married and we're teaching in the little school where she went in the little church where she's at and it's like she didn't dream up of growing up and staying at home her whole life she wanted to go and then she marries this guy who feels committed to this, this school there and this little church. And so she had to wrestle with that. And uh, finally, at the place, my wife came to the place and said, okay, God, I'll put myself in here at home. And it wasn't long after that then God called us to Grenada to the foreign field. And we went to Grenada. And uh, while in Grenada, those, were, those again were good growing years for us. I didn't know what all God had for us. But not long after we were there, I heard Grenadians saying, you know, you know, what we need is people to stay long term. You know, everybody, they come and they go, they come and they go. We want you to stay a long time. Like, I agree. And you know what? That, that's what we should do. You know, we, we should stay a long time. Being there for several years, uh, it didn't feel like this was a long term fit. My wife and I dreamed of how could we train young people in missions because we had a heart for four missions uh we have a heart for youth how could we do this and so we started and i remember one time for an anniversary her and i were away for a day 
and we were just talking, you know, maybe we could start something like maybe in Duluth, because we're from Minnesota, and that's a little bit bigger city up there, where we would train young people and get them experience in missions and this type of thing, and we're just kind of visioning and dreaming. Well, in 2004, so this is in the midst of our time in Grenada, we were back for several months. My wife was having difficulty with the pregnancy, so we uh, came back to the States to have our fourth child. Val Yoder came to me, and he said, Rick, would you... Uh, consider moving with me to Thailand to start the work of Igo. And when he explained his vision, it was exactly what my wife and I were visioning. And yet, here Val has this vision, and he says, I have the Bible school experience. I need somebody with foreign mission experience. Would you go with us to start? And it was like, wow. Uh, we moved to Thailand in 2006 to serve there. Now, I had never been there before, okay? Never been over to Asia. We didn't go and check it out ahead of time. We knew that's where God is calling us. After being there in Thailand and working with young people, I could look back on my life. I could see, you know what? No wonder God called us to Grenada. Now, while those were ministry years there and were good, that was preparing me for what I was doing in Thailand. And while we're in Grenada, it's like, you know what? No wonder God had me teaching school. That was preparing us for what we're going to do here and uh, in our work there in, in our church and so on. It's like every step of the way, God's hand was on it. And you know when we realize that? It's when we look back and we say, wow, God, you knew what was the next thing and so you, so you led us, okay? Um, we, we were, uh, so we were in Thailand for about seven years and then we're encouraged to take a furlough. They said, you know, if you're gonna go the distance, it's good every seven to 10 years to, to take a break, so we came to the States for a one-year furlough. And during that, and this was in 2013, during that furlough, um, we did a sold-out youth conference, which that was our first one. And the reason we did it was we wanted to put Anabaptist teaching on video. So we've been on the foreign field, and you can't just... Uh, call up a neighboring church said, hey, you know, would your pastor come and speak to us? As missionaries, we need input, right? You, you can't just do that. So it's easier and you can afford to, get, to pay $20 and get a DVD and, and, and you can pick the topic you want and they can teach you. Well, when you try to get Anabaptist teachers, there wasn't a lot out there. And so out of that burden, sharing that with others, I said, you know what? I'm gonna do this. So we're gonna get youth because youth, you guys are great to preach to. Like, look at you. You just sit there quietly and listen to me, believe in everything I tell you. Isn't this amazing? Uh, so we decided to, to put this first teach on deep. We're gonna invite youth. We uh, got a team of, of 10 men together who, uh, who shared this vision, said, yes, we'll make it happen. And we did our first sold out youth conference. We said, like, what do we call this? And the Lord just kind of gave me this title, sold out, because... I want young people to be sold out to God. So in January of 2014, uh, we did our first sold out. And it was at Parkview, uh, the church that seated about 250 people. We had no idea what to expect, okay? Uh, and because the men were from differing churches, we weren't just, in a sense, targeting one church. It's like, you know, how do we know how many people are gonna show up? What was amazing is God filled the church. And when we were done, we had the teaching on DVD, which, which other, you know, can, we can send out to other people, people can use it. But it was so encouraging what God did, they were like, wow, if, if it, even if we didn't record it, it was worth it for this. And uh, so we went, after we went back to Thailand, so we decided every two years we would come back on, on a two month little furlough type of thing, break. We said, okay, we'll do the next Soul Out Conference in two years and we'll do a new, a new series. So I've got a two year window to plan that as we're working there in Thailand. I had no idea that God was developing a ministry to young people that was gonna happen five, six years later down the road. I had, I had no idea, okay? This year, we're doing six sold out conferences that really the focus isn't about putting resources out there, it's ministering to young people. How did that start? God orchestrated it back in 2014 on a furlough. When we went back from our furlough here, we were prepared, we're gonna be in Thailand you know, indefinitely. Um, and within two years of that, God began to put on our heart to come back to the States to do full-time ministry, um, which has brought us to where we are now. We're back here in the States doing full-time ministry. 
Now, a couple things I want to uh, give you from this. I look back on my life to May of 92, and I am so glad that I told God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go, okay? First of all, that takes a whole load off of me. I don't have to figure out my life. I'm not in charge. I see so many people, and listen to this, I see so many people in missions that wrestle with these, these uh, their commitments like, okay, you know, the board said, we, you know, we said we'll come for three years, and now what? And we're praying, we're fasting, what do we do? And they wrestle with this, or, or people at home that are wrestling, how do we know what God's will is? I, I find a common struggle is, how do we find God's will? You know what? Don't wrestle with that. Just tell God you'll do whatever you want to do and just let him lead you. He'll do it. He'll do it. Uh, when we're in Grenada, we're just there till God tells us differently. When, when God called us to Thailand, okay, then we're gonna go. And, and the timing, God worked all that out. Uh, when we're in Thailand, we're gonna be there until God tells us differently. And until all of a sudden God calls us back here, now we're back in the States. What's next? I don't know, but guess what? I'm not in charge. I don't have to figure it out. And that is so free. What I want you all to come away with from this morning is give God control. Just say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go, okay? I believe, I believe God has a specific plan for every one of you. There's no one else like you, okay? Um, some people don't like that, that concept. They think God's will is more like a smorgasbord. Okay, because if you if if you say that God has a specific plan for everybody, and you mess it up, then you mess up God's whole system. Okay, and and that would be confusing, uh, you know. So God has everything lined up for me, and then uh, if two reasons why I believe this in Scripture, whenever God would call somebody, what would He call them to? A specific task. You never find a time in Scripture where God says, follow me, uh, I've got a whole lot of options for you. No, it was always Moses, this is what I want you to do. David was called to a specific task. Uh, Saul was called to a specific task. Peter, everybody that God called, he always had plans for them, okay? When Scripture says that before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, like God knew who you are going to be, and it was God who ordained, why would God make me like this and then say, Rick, the world's yours. Just do whatever you want. Just make sure it gives me glory. I just don't see that. And furthermore, if you believe that there's all sorts of options for me and I need to choose, then guess who's in charge? You are. And the choices are up to you. What if, what if you choose the wrong thing? So when I had options to go to Grenada, I could have stayed in Minnesota. I had also had options to go to, to New York. Uh, which one do I pick? They're all good options, okay? Who's in charge? I'm in charge. What happens when it gets bad? <sighs> we should have never went to Grenada. We should have stayed in Minnesota. Or we should have, you see what happens? But when you say, yes, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go, God's a good shepherd, God's a good communicator, and he just leads you, and the pressure's not on you, okay? And I'll be honest right now, Moving back to the States hasn't been the easiest move for us. But I don't fight it because who called me here? It's God. So I just follow him, okay? I just follow him. The most freeing thing you can do is say, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And God knows, God knows the next step. So this year in October, I'll turn 50. So I am not really a youth anymore. Uh, I look back, and yeah, my dream of going in Gospel Echoes never happened. But that's okay. God had other things for me. Uh, and you know what? God's probably spared me of some things by saying, no, Rick, you can't do that one. You can't do that one. Here's, here's what you need to do. You want to come to being 50, 75, however many years God gives you, and you want to look back and say, you know what? I'm glad that I wasn't in control in my life, okay? 
there is no glorified place to serve God. And what I mean by that, sometimes we lift up foreign missions. Uh, we need people in foreign missions. We need people who are plugged in and connected and involved in missions at home too. And the question for you is not so much the where. God will take care of that. Your question, what you need to do, is be faithful right now as a young person, okay? Be faithful at home. Be faithful where you are right now. All the while saying, God, whatever you have next, I'll do it. Wherever it is, I'll do it. And then until he, until he tells you something different, what do you do? Just keep following him right now, okay? So right now, God has my wife and I and our we have four boys at home yet. We're in Reading. So that's where we're going to be, and we need to be faithful here. Our job is to be faithful. Our job isn't to figure out everything. How long will God have us here? We don't know, but our job is to be faithful. Okay? Now, let me tell you, let me tell you one more thing. Um, God has plans for us, and God wants to use you. The only kind of people that God uses are ordinary people. Um, in 2019, so we have been back in the States uh, about two and a half years, okay? Uh, and our serving God and, and our ministry here is growing. We have plenty of opportunities. Things are going well for us. Subtly in my heart, I mentioned to you a struggle of pride and why I believe God didn't allow me to go on Gospel Echoes was because of, I don't think I could have handled it at age 19, well, after about two and a half years here in the States in ministry, subtly pride was coming up in my heart. And I didn't know it at the time, unfortunately. I should have. I should have been a aware of it because of a few different thoughts that would come to my mind sometimes. But uh, I wasn't. And God needed to discipline me for my pride, okay? Um, I share that with you for this. When God sees something going on in here that isn't good, he loves you too much just to let it go, okay? Um, and I told you that I don't think God let me go on gospel echoes because I couldn't handle being on stage. Well, here now I am at, at, at 45, at 47, and I'm on stage, and I start to believe the things that people are telling me. Uh, and God needed to, God needed to, to discipline me. Um, and he did. And his reason for discipline was pride in my heart, thinking that, you know what? I can do these things, I can help these people, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but as, as God, God disciplined me and had to break me in a way that I was not broken before, and I needed it, I needed it. Um, I tell you that because Satan's gonna try to get you on one of two ditches. One would be, oh, I'm just a nobody. I don't have any gifts. I can't do anything, okay? That's not true. The other one would be to really be excited about, about my giftings and to go and to use them for God's glory. And then Satan's like, oh, yeah, look at what you're doing, okay? And he'll try to either get you down in discouragement, I'm no good, or lift you up in pride. And what God wants you to do is to use the gifts he's given you to passionately serve God, all the while realizing that, you know what? Take the grace out of my life, and I'm... I'm dead in sins. God's a good shepherd. God's a good communicator. You will never, I can promise you this, you will never come to the end of your life and look back and say, I wish I kept more control. Never. Okay? At the end of your life, I am confident that you're going to look back and say, I'm glad I told God I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm glad that, I, that Jesus is a good shepherd, 
that he leads us, that he's in charge. I don't have to be. And I'm glad he loves me enough to spank me along the way when I need it. And part of the reason why I tell you that little story there is because sometimes I used to think that once I get to be older, I'll have it all together, okay? And I realized, you know what? I'm still just as much a mess as I was when I was a young person, and I need God's grace. Um, I look back, and I'm so glad that I said, yes, God, whatever it may be. Never dreamed I would do the things I'm doing. I couldn't have orchestrated that. I didn't plan that. But God did, and looking back, I'm glad I've trusted him. I'm glad I followed him. Now, two principles I want to give you, and then we're done. Keep older people involved in your life, okay? One of the things I did as a young person is ask others for advice. Uh, keep older people involved in your life. Older as in people who are ahead of you, okay? If you're 20, are there some 30-year-olds that you respect, some 35-year-olds? Get advice from them and the 40 and the 56-year-olds. Always have older people involved in your life. They've walked ahead of you, okay? Uh, always have older people involved in your life. The second thing is this, no private confession, okay? I have seen many people be destroyed by secret sins. So if there's something in your life that isn't right, don't just keep that between you and God. You tell somebody, okay? You tell somebody. Throughout my years, I'm confident one of the things that has spared me is I've gone public in anything that I've struggled with. And I don't know, I don't know what led me to that, that conviction, but I know that there's something freeing that happens when I tell my wife, when I tell my coworkers, when I tell a mentor or whatever, I tell them, you know what? I'm struggling, this is what I'm struggling with. There's something powerful that happens. So don't walk alone, don't travel alone. Share what you're struggling with with somebody. And I'm confident that'll spare you a whole lot of grief. It's those secret sins that take people down. Let's pray. Father, come to you in the name of Jesus. I'm thankful for each one of these young people here. And I don't know what they are facing with right now, what they're wrestling with. But I pray you would speak to their hearts. I pray they would see you as a good shepherd. I pray they would see you as a loving father. And I pray their heart would be turned toward you in a way that's saying, yes, God, you just go ahead and do whatever you want with me. I pray they would trust you with their life. So, Father, I pray you could use my testimony this morning to encourage them. And I pray that in 10 years, 20 years from now, if you still tarry, if we're here, that they would look back and say, I'm glad I told God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Thank you, God, that you've got plans for us. And thank you that we can say yes to you and know we're in good hands. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.